So today is September 11th, and what you can see in this, this picture here, um, this is the 9-11 uh, the Memorial and Museum in New York City, and if you haven't gotten to go, um, I would definitely uh, encourage you to do it. Uh, they, they've, they've done a really wonderful job uh, and it created a really beautiful tribute to the, to the victims and the people who were the first responders. And uh, it's, it's appropriate that we talk about the problem of evil and suffering on 9-11. But of course, you, you, when you think about 9-11, you think, well, that was, that was something evil, but it was done by evil people. Right? There were evil people who carried out that attack. So I can, I can somewhat have a category for why that sort of thing might have happened. Um, when people bring up the problem of evil, this is what they're talking about. Why did that evil act happen? Why did God allow that to happen? But it becomes even more of a problem when you're not talking about something carried out by evil people, but when you're, when you're talking about a, a natural disaster. Um, this is a, a picture of a, of a, um, a city in Indonesia um, after the uh, 2004 tsunami. Um, and where, where the devastation was actually much, much larger than anything we saw on, on 9-11. And you can't easily go in and say this was caused by, you know, these specific evil people committing an evil act. Um, this was a natural disaster, so why would God allow that? Uh, and so w when we say the problem of evil, that's what we're talking about, is people saying, why does God allow 9-11? Why does God allow something like this tsunami? Um, I want to make clear the fact that, that we're talking about this and we have slides and I'm going to try to talk us through what the Bible has to say about this. Um, I recognize this is a situation that um, has a lot of gravity and a lot of seriousness and um, it's not one that we're going to be able to exhaust and say, we understand it, that like there's, there's no way. And I also recognize some of you are probably in the midst of, of um, uh, suffering and pain right now and I want to make sure that, that you understand that, uh, that we care deeply about you and that we're not going to be able to explain that away this evening. So um, in that sense, I, I come to this topic not with confidence, but with fear and trembling, um, I think, as all of us should. So um, let's go ahead and also think about, about who we're talking to. When, when you think about the problem of evil and someone asks, why does God allow something bad to happen? Um, it, it may come from a couple different sources. It may come from someone who is a skeptic, someone who is skeptical of God's existence, um, some, someone along those lines, or it may come from someone who is in the middle of that pain and suffering um, themselves. And, and the way that uh, you address this question may be different depending on those two situations. Now, even as I put this up here, you may already be thinking like, oh, I know someone who's in that skeptic camp, and oh, I also know someone who's in, in that suffering camp, and both of them are wondering this question. But I would encourage you, don't just think about other people. Who's that other person who's a skeptic? Who's that other person who's, who's suffering? I would encourage you to think about this um, in regard to yourself. There may be a time in the future, or even right now, where you yourself are in skeptic mode, or you yourself will be in suffering mode. You see what I'm saying? So if, if you're not in that mode now, then today, perhaps tonight can be a chance where you can really think through these issues and try to, to, to prepare yourself, think through what do you believe about how God allows evil and suffering to occur before you're in the middle of that skeptical moment or that suffering moment. Um, for, for some of the college students in the room, I know when I was in college, I thought about this question, and I, I tried to you know, think through it thoroughly, but there's no getting around it. Like the, it was, um, I, when I thought about this question, it was pretty theoretical because your average American college student doesn't see a lot of evil and suffering relative to what's out there in the world. And it's easy to think of it as a theoretical problem, an intellectual problem to be solved, um, but the truth is that, that that's, that's not really the case. This is not something theoretical and far away. It's close at hand, far closer than, than you may realize. Um, the truth is that all of us are you know, a phone call away from our lives being turned upside down. Um, just uh, even for, for, for my own family, a few, we've had a, a couple of family friends uh, just here in the last few months where um, one family friend, they found out that a little five-year-old girl had been uh, diagnosed with leukemia. That was, you know, in May, and it was kind of out of the no nowhere. Similar situation with another family friend who had a little boy who went from sick to, to um, being diagnosed with a degenerative nerve disease that, have, that has uh, basically left him paralyzed. So the point is that that's sudden. You can't just say like, well, maybe sometime in the future this will happen to me. It can happen right in the mode. And when you're a college student and, all you, and you just hang around other college students, it seems far off. It seems theoretical, but it's not. So, we, so um, I guess before, we're, we're about to go into like 
the arguments and the premises and the conclusions and all that stuff. And, and I guess I would say, even as we talk about these things, um, it, it is important to, have the, to work those things through, but if you or someone in your life is suffering, going into philosophy mode and arguing about these specific things is probably not the best move. Really what people generally need in the middle of hurt, in the middle of suffering, is uh, someone who can show some kindness, some empathy, and maybe not necessarily words in that moment. Um, most of the people who've been through suffering and come out on the other side, um, they always point to the support and the love of their church, not the smart person who gave them some things that they didn't know previously. Okay, given, given all that, I'll go ahead and dive into to what's typically called the, the logical problem of evil, okay? So I'm going to give you premises and a, uh, premises and a conclusion. This seems dorky. I know it seems you know, unnecessarily intellectual, but you do need to do it this way. You do, because otherwise people will say something like, well, why does God allow evil? Hmm? Like that statement on its own is not actually an argument. So I'm going to try to give you an actual argument. This is the actual argument that your average atheist would try to make as to why they think God doesn't exist. You know, most of the time you could just argue about whether there are good arguments for whether God does exist, but I think this is the only argument that's really out there saying God can't exist. And so here are the premises. If God exists, God's all-powerful. And uh, if God exists, God is good. Good so far? Yeah, these are good. Um, number three, an all-powerful... All good God would not allow evil to exist, right? He would have both the, the means and the desire to prevent evil from existing. Uh, number four, evil does exist. And if you accept all those premises, premises, then you would have to conclude that God doesn't exist. That's the argument. And what um, given, so I want you to think about the argument. Um, I think more or less the conclusion does flow from those four premises. And so you have to think, well, which premise is problematic? When the atheist, atheist formulates this argument, the, the, usually the desire is to push Christians on those first two, saying, are you sure God's all-powerful? Are you sure that God is good? You're going to have to give one of them up. And there are quite a few people who give up number one. They say, well, God would like to prevent evil, but he can't because of reasons, once you, you know, you name it. Um, there was a famous book written in the 80s called When, good things happen to, oh, sorry, when Bad Things Happen to Good People. And you had to wade through a lot of book. But basically, by the end of the book, premise number one gets thrown out. Okay? But I don't want us to throw out premise one or two. I want us to look at these others. So it turns out there's a couple of other problematic uh, 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 pieces here. The first is for the atheist to, uh, to, um, to say evil exists. Once they say evil exists, they actually have a little bit of an, of an issue. Um, uh, so uh, Pastor Allen brought up Dostoevsky this morning. Uh, so just by coincidence, I, I, I am as well. Dostoevsky is very famous for, for the phrase, if, if there is no God, everything is permissible. What he meant by that is, if there is no God who is a source for what constitutes moral value, for what constitutes good and evil, then we have a random universe, just atoms and biochemistry and stuff floating around, and it's very difficult to say that something is good or bad. You see what I'm saying? So if you, say, if you want to say there's no God, then you also have to jettison these con this concept of good and evil. You, don't, you no longer get to say things should be a certain way. One of the ways you can tell this, by the way, is if there is no God and we live in a, in a random universe purely governed by chance and by, by atoms colliding and physical laws, then everything about the universe should be governed by science, scientific laws, right? Science has nothing to say about what should happen. Science only describes what does happen. So if you are an atheist, it, it, it's very difficult to say where do these should concepts come from? Why should something be one way versus another? All you can say is, I like this or I don't like that. But it's very hard to say things should have been a different way. Um, to formulate it a different way, it's hard to say that someone has done wrong, someone has broken a moral law if those laws have nowhere to come from. Okay? You could give a whole talk just on this topic, the idea that, that good and evil um, rely on a supernatural uh, frame of reference in order to exist. Um, now, some atheists will, will say, fine, there is no good and evil. And they'll, they'll say, but I know you Christians believe in good and evil, so therefore you still have to stick with it. Um, but the truth is, I don't, I don't think anybody really believes that. And you can tell, well, as soon as they're wronged, as soon as something bad happens to them, uh, they, they very quickly say, like, that was wrong, that was unfair. And so their, their own conception of good and evil comes right back. And I think it's ingrained in every single person's mind. It's very hard to consistently live as if you don't believe there really is a right or wrong. And college students, you may hear 
professors, you won't hear this from me, but you may hear professors in other departments say things like, well, you know, our concepts of good and evil and right or wrong are culturally bound and they're just, you know, social conventions and blah, blah, blah. They don't believe that either. Because as soon as they're robbed, they don't say, you violated a social norm. They don't say that. They say, you did something wrong. They immediately become an absolutist and believe that good and evil really do exist. Okay? So, um, so that's one problematic premise. Um, but the bigger problem in this problem of evil is an all-powerful good God would not allow evil to exist. It seems reasonable, but it's actually kind of hard to prove that. Um, in, in fact, uh, I think you can see it becomes, even, it becomes more problematic when you realize what the person is actually saying. Really what they're saying is they, they're saying, if I were God, if I were in charge, I would prevent evil. Evil, doesn't hap- e- evil does happen, it's not prevented, therefore God does not exist. I think when I phrase it that way, you can tell that's not a very good argument, right? It turns out um, a huge number of arguments against this, the existence of God all more or less follow the same kind of pattern. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the comedian Eddie Izzard, uh, in one of his recent uh, stand-ups, he, he went into this huge long rant about how big the universe is. He says, the universe is huge, the universe is enormous, and there's only this one tiny little blip, and we're supposed to be- believe that God made us and that we're significant. And everybody laughs. They're like, ha, 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 those silly people who believe in God. His whole argument is, if he were in God, he would not make so much empty universe. There is a lot of empty universe, therefore God does not exist. That's a terrible argument. That's a terrible argument. It really doesn't flow. And of course, the, the point is, how would you know what God would do? You have no idea. It's almost as if he was saying, that's wasteful use of space. Who cares? Like, you, anyway, do you all with me? Most, many arguments along these lines, they have these exact, exact same problems. Um, I've had a lot of friends who, who get frustrated about God's hiddenness. Why doesn't God make himself more obvious? It's the same problem. They're basically saying, if I were God, I would make myself obvious. God is not obvious, therefore God does not exist. It's not a good argument. And almost all these challenges to God follow that same kind of pattern. You will see what I'm saying? And, and so the, the point is that, like, we don't know what God would do. We're in no position to say, if God exists, he would do this. We're not in a position where we can make those kind of statements with any kind of, of um, certainty. And it's very hard to say something like, the best way for God to address evil is to prevent it. The only option. That's very hard to prove. And um, it turns out, because of these difficulties I've just described, so I gave you the problem of evil, and I showed you two difficulties. One is that, what is, what is evil if you don't believe in God? And the, and the second is that, that um, we're in no position to say what God would or would not do. In the professional philosopher community, um, the problem of evil, this logical problem of evil I've described has been considered dead for 50 years, basically. Like, nobody buys it anymore. They're like, that third premise is too hard to prove. So they leave it behind. Okay? Even so, that may not be very, that may not be very comforting to the skeptic. They, they, they may say, fine, fine. Maybe God has a good reason for, for allowing evil to exist. But you, the Christian, you have to tell me what the reason is. Why would God allow it to exist? And when you give a reason, when you, when you say, here's why God would allow evil to exist, um, that statement you would give is called a theodicy. That's a fancy word, but you'll hear people throw that word around, so I'm telling you what it is. Theodicy, the the, what does a theo mean? God, yeah, very good. And the other part, the, the, the D-I-C-Y, refers to like justice or vindication. It's like vindicating God. It's a defense of God. And um, you can buy whole books that go into all these different theodicies and all these descriptions of why God would allow something to happen. And uh, some of you may have thought, like, that's what this whole talk tonight's going to be about. And I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not going to go too much into that. And I, I will tell you, you should be very cautious about going into detail in terms of, of your various theodicies and saying God would allow evil because X, Y, Z. In fact, the Bible actually gives us several examples of people who immediately try to say why God would allow evil and they get it wrong, right? Think about Job's friends. All the bad things happen to Job and Job's friends say, well, it's probably because you did something wrong. That's the most common incorrect theodicy. Something bad happened to you and it's your fault. God allowed this to happen because you did something wrong. Kaboom. <laughs> Um, in fact, the disciples, Jesus' disciples do the same thing. Do you remember when? They see a man born blind, and they, see, they ask Jesus, so who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents that he was born blind? Do you remember what Jesus' answer was? 
Jesus says it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's a pretty broad answer, but generally I think this is the answer we've got. God allows evil to occur because there is some greater good or greater glory that's going to occur as a result. Basically, God thinks that it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to allow that evil occur. Um, we, have a, we do have a few other examples in Scripture where they actually talk about this in detail. Uh, one of the famous ones is, oh, oh gosh, this thing is going crazy. Da, 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 da. It got stuck. Bah, bah. See, no, see, don't look because you're going to mess my thing up. Don't look. Yeah. Okay, there we go. There we go. Now we're back. All right, awesome. This thing got stuck. Okay, uh, does anyone, Genesis 50, does anyone know what story this is from? The very end of Genesis, this is about Joseph. Uh, and who is Joseph speaking to here? Joseph is speaking to his brothers who had been um, <clears throat> less than kind to him. In fact, they threw him down a well. I think they originally intended for him to die, and instead they sold him into slavery and told his father that he was dead. Okay. And then much, much later, the, the brothers, you know, Joseph is preserved, and God puts him in this position in Egypt. And the brothers um, are reunited with Joseph, and uh, it looks like God has actually done a change in their heart. Some of the behavior of the brothers at the end of Genesis really shows a, a true change of heart. Uh, but they're still pretty nervous. They're, they think, you know, is Joseph, sorry, you know, are you, are you angry with us? Um, are you going to punish us? And, and that's a pretty reasonable uh, uh, response. But Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. One of the things this passage tells us is it's, it's possible for these brothers to do something evil and they meant it for evil, but in that same action, God meant it for good. You see what I'm saying? In fact, that actually shows that God can ordain. It's a good word. God can ordain that evil exists without himself being the author of it. So God didn't do anything evil, but he did ordain that that evil act by the brothers occur because he had a plan. So this idea that God can ordain evil, but he is not the author of evil, that is something I think scripture really reinforces. And also notice that this is really God's plan. It's not like the brothers did it and God had to scramble to put together plan B. That's how a lot of people think about God. They think God is reacting to us. That's not really what scripture teaches. It shows that God is really sovereign and really is in control. Okay. Um, now, so I told you that the, the logical problem of evil is, is dead, and that is, that is basically true. But a really, uh, a really um, sharp skeptic will turn it around and they say, okay, fine, I'm going to reformulate my problem of evil just a little bit, okay? I'm going to reformulate it. Okay, let's try again. If God exists, God is all-powerful. If God exists, God is good. An all-powerful, good God would not allow unnecessary evil to exist. Okay, and so we can argue about what is meant by unnecessary, but generally, you know, um, gratuitous, pointless evil and suffering. And then they argue uh, pointless, unnecessary, gratuitous evil exists, therefore God does not exist. And if we define our terms properly, then uh, you can get to the point where a Christian will actually ex accept premise three. Say, okay, God doesn't allow evil with no purpose. He has a plan. He has a, he has a reason why he allows it, okay? And then the atheist, so, so which of the premises is left? Then we say premise four is false. There's no evil out there. There's no suffering that, out there that is pointless, so we deny that premise, and the skeptic says, really? There's no pointless evil. Are you sure? And then you'll run into a slightly different problem, which I'm going to call the, the Google image search problem. Um, I'm gonna, I'll tell you a parenting story real quick. And for any new parents in the, in the audience, this will, this will you know, be a cautionary tale. Um, my, my wife uh, uh, and I homeschool our children, and uh, I guess this probably happened almost a year ago. Um, one of the, you know, in, in my um, son's school process, they were learning about different kinds of animals. And at one point, they bring up the old Google image search. You all know a Google image search? You want to search whatever it is? And they were trying to learn about um, rhinos, as I recall. So if you go on Google image search and you search like the black rhino, white rhino, whatever, you get these different kinds of rhinos, there they are. But I think what happened is my wife, uh, without checking ahead of time, there was our mistake, so we learned from our mistake. She Googled, like, Asian rhino, which is one particular kind of rhino. And they're learning and saying, oh, it's a little different than this other one that you see in Africa. And then one of the images that came up was a rhino that had been poached, right? The, the horn had been ripped off. And it was, you know, it's one thing to see an animal that's dead. It's another thing to see an animal that is ruined, effectively. And so my wife, she, I think she initially thought, well, I could just scroll past the image, but she thought, eh. I'm going to try to explain what this is so that my son's not, like, scared of some weird thing. And so she tried to explain, this is what happened. Some poachers came and 
cut this rhino's horn off and it's really bad and it's really wrong and the, the world's full of, of people who do wrong things like that and it really upset my son. And so we learned the, the lesson and we said, be careful of that Google image search. Make sure you really check whatever you're doing before you go in. And some of you may be thinking like, you know, that could have been a lot worse. Yes, I know, it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> I'm aware of that. Anyway, so don't... But then I thought about it and I'm like, Google image search is a theologically frightening thing. Because as soon as you tell the skeptic, I don't believe there are any pointless, unnecessary evils. The skeptic will bring up Google image search and says, we're going to search for something. Uh, let's search birth defects. Would you like to do that? And you will say, no, please don't. Because if you do, I don't have it. Don't worry. <laughs> like, I, did, I didn't put that up here. But you know if you do, you would see some things that are horrible and are true, right? Things that are real. And so the skeptic could just scroll through those and say, did this need to happen? Is this necessary that this happen? Okay, how about this one? How about this one? How about this one? And there's going to be a thousand of them, probably more than that. And what I, for, I'll just tell you, for me personally, what I've always struggled with was a, with the problem of evil is I feel like if you take all the evil in the world, something awful like birth defects, and you put that all in front of my mind, that I would just say, like, I can't, I can't deal. I can't say, oh, yes, God has a plan for that and that and that and that. Like, I would not be able to deal with the magnitude of that amount of suffering and horror, right? And so Google image search is a, is a very scary thing is because it threatens to bring all, this, all these things that are true in front of your face and say, this is how horrible the world is. And it's only our desire for comfort that makes us say, please don't show me that. That's pretty scary. And so I think this is probably more so where we're at. Your average skeptic... They're thinking of all these awful things, which we now have immediate access to. If you just watch the news, you see these awful images that show up, right? And so here's, here's how I would, I would recommend that you as a believer address it. Instead of trying to, instead of trying to dismiss, um, the better way to go about it is say, how does the Bible respond to a litany of horrors? They don't say that they don't exist. The Bible agrees that the world's full of sorrows. And the Bible's also full of phrases like, um, in, in Revelation, the, the, the gathered uh, martyrs in heaven, they, they say, how long, O Lord? Right? They look at this world full of sorrows and they say, how long, O Lord, until you make all this right? Okay? Because the truth is that the world is fallen. The world is full of horrors. Um, as was explained in the sermon this morning, that is connected to sin. We live in a fallen world and that's what the reason that you have these things happen. Um, but I, I, had a, I had an interesting conversation with my, my, with my son this morning. I realized I prepared for this whole talk and I hadn't talked to him about it at all. And I said, so I asked Tal, I asked my eight-year-old, I said, how, you know, um, why do you think God allows um, evil things to happen? Why does he allow uh, people to do evil things? And his answer was like, well, at some point he's going to make it all right. He's going he's gonna to stop it. And that's basically right. We haven't seen the whole story. See, that Google image search will give you the illusion of omniscience. It will make you think, oh my goodness, I have seen all these horrible things and now I know them. And there's no explanation for that. But the truth is you still only know a part of the truth. You haven't seen the whole story. You don't know how those things interconnect and you don't know how it's going to end. Except the Bible does tell, tell us that in the end, God will redeem all those different things. In general, I will tell you one thing that tends to separate people on, on this particular question, some people think that if something bad happens, like, it can't be undone. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blight on history and that can, nothing can ever make up for it. Um, and the, but the other way to think about it is if God redeems everything, if God brings everything back together, maybe God is wise enough, get, maybe God sees more than we do to know that that, that that evil can be overcome. And even though it did happen, that that's not the whole story. I think we can probably go into a little more detail in terms of the Bible's, you know, descriptions of, um, of, of, of evil. Um, and again, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I, I, some people do bring this up as an intellectual struggle, but for most people, it's, it, it's a personal struggle. And even if you gave a, like, intellectual answer, that's still not really what they're looking for. What they're really looking for is some kind of um, reassurance that God cares, Okay. So uh, I think one way we can see this is in the story of Abraham and Isaac. So that's what we're going to go through now. Uh, don't remember the story. So everybody knows the, the first part of the story of Abraham and Isaac is all happiness, right? Because Abraham and Sarah are old, but God makes a promise to them. And sure enough, God does a miracle. 
and gives Abraham and Sarah a child in their old age. Um, Isaac is the child of promise. And then when Isaac is older, um, God tells him, take your son up onto this mountain and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Okay? Um, and uh, I, I told you a moment ago, I approached this topic with fear and trembling. Um, there's a very famous book called Fear and Trembling, uh, written in the 1800s by Soren Kierkegaard, and it is, it is, the whole book is about this story. Um, specifically, it talks about how Abraham got up very early that morning to take Isaac to the mountain. Chances are that Abraham couldn't sleep. Abraham didn't know how to respond to this. Um, and some people, including Kierkegaard, said, well, maybe Abraham had to take the leap of faith and do something irrational. The biblical perspective is that that's not the case. Abraham acted very rationally. Because when someone has proven themselves trustworthy like God has, to trust someone who's trustworthy is rational, right? But still, e even though I can say that, to think of someone actually going and raising the knife to, to sacrifice their own son is a, is a bit much. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show you how uh, one of the more famous skeptics of the last uh, couple of decades responded to this. And I'll just tell you before I put the slide up um, that you won't like it, okay? So everybody emotionally prepare yourself to not like the next slide. Um, okay. Uh, this is Christopher Hitchens. Uh, he, he's, um, he's a famous, famous atheist, wrote a lot of books, including a book called God is Not Great. Uh, and he was talking about this story of Abraham and Isaac, and he said, I'll tell you something. If I was told to sacrifice my children to prove my devotion to God and admire the man who said, yes, I'll get my kid to so, show my love of God, I would say, F you. And what's your response to that? The immediate response is like, what an ignorant arrogant, foolish thing to say. Yes, that is true. But the deeper response to this has to be one of compassion. Because the truth is that Christopher Hitchens like kind of missed the point of the story, didn't he? That's not the whole point of the story. Sadly, we can't tell him this. Um, he passed away in 2011. What's really interesting is this kind of like gut reaction of like, no, don't tell me to sacrifice my kid. Um, it actually has shown up even among Christians. So I'll tell you a famous story about, about Martin Luther. So I think everybody's heard more or less of Martin Luther. Some people don't know that he, he, he married a nun. Just to complete the irony of the Reformation, he married a nun. <laughs> so, so awesome. Anyway, and the... And uh, I know, like, sometimes people, like, say, uh, like, oh, historical marriage is boring, but whatever. Like, this was a former monk and a former nun, and they loved each other and had a bunch of kids, and it was kind of an awesome marriage. And uh, his wife's name was, was Catherine, and he called her Katie. And uh, there's a story of him, you know, he, he and his children and his wife, and they would always have visitors in their house. And they're all sitting around the dinner table, and this particular night, they're talking about Abraham and Isaac. And uh, they're all, these are... Very blunt Germans, right? Okay, and so, so Katie at some point is like, I, I, I can't believe, I can't believe this story. I can't deal with this story. I can't believe that God would want a father to treat his son that way. And Martin's response to her, you can guess what it is. He said, God treated his own son that way. So what's the part of the story that Hitchens missed? It's not merely that Abraham didn't sacrifice his son and God was like, okay, now I know you'll sacrifice your son. It's that God provided a substitute. God provided a ram, and Abraham sacrificed this ram. The ram dies instead of Isaac, and that all points ahead to Christ. So ultimately, if someone is in the midst of suffering, they don't need an intellectual answer. What they need is the gospel. What they need is to hear God cares this much. He cares enough that he provided Jesus. He provided Jesus as a means to take away sin, to defeat evil, to defeat death. And I think the truth is when we look at someone struggling, we look at someone suffering, we're not going to be able to be very specific and say, you are suffering for this specific reason. Like, we're not going to be able to do that. But we know that the answer is not God doesn't care because God cares that much. So I guess that's how it ends. is is that um, God the Son enters into our suffering and he redeems it. We don't have a God who doesn't care. What's interesting about that is it's not just God entering into suffering, but God actually redeems us from our own sin. This whole time I've been talking about evil as if it's something external, right? The problem of evil, evil and suffering out there. But the truth is, 
when we talk about the problem of evil, we also have to talk about the fact that we are evil. And God fixes that problem of evil too through Jesus. So we know that God cares. He doesn't leave us hanging. And he gives us an answer that in some ways is much better than like an intellectual, here's the reason why I love suffering. He didn't give us an answer to that problem. He gave us a person. He gave us a savior. And that's actually far, far more gratifying and far more able to sustain you through a difficult time. Um, and, I, and I'll just end. This, this definitely affects the way that we view evil, the way that we view suffering. Um, it is okay to mourn. If you, if you are in a circumstance where you go to a funeral, something awful has happened, to mourn is okay. And Christians certainly mourn. Uh, we talked about Job earlier. Uh, the Bible talks about Job tearing his clothes and crying out. But in all these things, he did not charge God with evil, and Job did not sin. That's what it says. And so it's okay to mourn, but we mourn in kind of a special way because we know that even though there may be death, death is swallowed up in victory because of what Jesus did. That God, whatever pain and suffering we see, that God can redeem that. And that's the reason that, that a, a Christian funeral is ultimately different, right? Um, when you go, so uh, Paul uses this phrase, we do not grieve as others who have no hope. So there is a way to look at pain and suffering and say, yes, it is bad. Yes, it is wrong. Yes, it grieves us. This world is full of sorrows and genuinely have that response, but yet over and above that have a response of hope and of trust in God because he's proven himself trustworthy. Okay, I think, I know that was like way intense, but whatever, but um, I'll go ahead and close. I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to pray for us that this, you know, these two verses in particular can, can um, hit us, and then I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to, to answer questions that you have. We still have a bit of time. So, um, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for stories of Joseph and Abraham and Job and, and um, Jesus, that um, through these stories, through these narratives, we don't just get little tidy philosophical answers, but we get a, a way of you showing us how much you care. Um, I pray for each of us that, um, you know, right now, for some of us in the room, even within the next few weeks, we may be faced with um, suffering or with evil that we didn't know we were going to. I, I pray that as we meditate on your word between now and then, that you will um, uh, help our spirits to rest in the fact that you love us and you care about us. Um, I pray specifically. I, I know there's someone in the room who's going to experience something like this. They're going to experience some suffering. They're going to get a phone call. And I pray that your reward would sustain them in the middle of that moment. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay. That was intense, but I'm happy to field questions on this topic. We've got two microphones. Cody's on that side. I'm on this side. Just motion to one of us if you have a question about uh, evil and suffering. Yes, sir. Yeah, so you talked about the concept of God ordaining evil but not authoring it. Can you flesh that out a little more? Like those, you know, just the semantics of that, like what does that actually, how do you differentiate those? Like, Oh, yeah, it's a good question because it's like, well, how did God ordain it if it really was those people? And, and I, I think the truth is um, it's, it's, it would be a mystery but not a contradiction, if that makes sense. You know, just like, the, you know, the Bible has something like the Trinity. The Trinity is a mystery, but not a contradiction. But probably the deepest mystery, but not a contradiction, is the idea that God is sovereign, but man is accountable. Um, the way, the thing that helped me to see it more than anything else is um, read through the book of Acts and look at the sermons and then the prayers that the disciples give. Um, because in that case, in that case, they're actually talking about the death of Jesus. So they use this language. They're like, Dear Lord, by your sovereign plan, um, our, our Savior Jesus was crucified by Pontius Pilate and the Romans. And it's weird. It's like it said it both ways. God's plan, they did it. So they affirm it in both places. And, uh, I mean, the reason it, looking at Jesus is such a nice example is because it really clearly is God's plan, but these people really genuinely were responsible for doing it. Um, and that shows this idea that it's not God, like, reacting to whatever's going on. Um, did anybody see that stupid movie, uh, The Adjustment Bureau? You know what I'm talking about? So that's a reacting. That, that's like, that would, if God operated like that, God would be like, uh, like, oh gosh, didn't see that coming. Like, and there actually are people who advocate what's called open theism. Have you ever heard of this? This is the idea that God doesn't know the future. 
God's like the master chess player, but he still doesn't know what you're going to do, and he's continually moving the pieces around to react. I think Acts kind of affirms, like, no, God knew exactly what was going to happen. He really had a, a plan in place. Um, so anyway, I, I, for me, I, I live with the mystery. I say that's how Acts affirms it. Um, one other helpful thing about thinking about um, God's sovereignty and the death of Jesus, um, I heard Tim Keller point this out. He said, um, he said, if you had asked the disciples, like the night that Jesus died, and, and asked the disciples, like, why did God allow this to happen? They would be like, I have no idea. There's no possible answer. <laughs> like in that moment, they would say, there's no possible answer. But then, of course, they found out the rest of the story, and they say, oh, it turns out God did have a reason. And so um, that's comforting for the rest of us, because if, if you're in a circumstance where something evil is happening and you don't know the answer, um, you would be the, in the same position that the disciples would have been the night of Jesus' death, right? You, you're, you say, we're, we're midway in the story. You're only seeing little bits and pieces, but you haven't seen the whole thing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So when we go to like Romans 5, which we read this morning, but mm. Romans 5, 3 is probably one of my favorite verses, and it talks about how suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, things. Um, why can't something else produce that? Um, produce a hope that's like unwavering and, and I think everyone in the room can look back and the times they suffered was the time they clinged to hope most um, but when we go back to the like the premises that you said but if it got us good like why why is he doing all these means um, through suffering or like through allowing evil yeah, yeah. Um, like why if if he is a good God like why why was the tree eaten from you know and like it goes back and then the whole argument of free will and and his his heart for us wanting to choose him and like it not being forced and him being a just god that has given us freedom and and making that by jesus as well so yeah, that's a that's a that's a big question. This I think most of what you're asking kind of goes back to that. You remember that slide on the theodicy where I actually said far less than you would have thought I would. A lot of it goes back to that. So one theodicy that people will give is that um, there are parts places in the Bible where it clearly seems to say that through suffering we build character or through suffering we glorify God. I think those are definitely true, right? Clearly, Job glorified God in the way that he endured suffering, and we all hear know about it now. Um, but I hesitate to say like, oh, well, that is the, that alone accounts for the whole penumbra of, of, of suffering. That's, do you see what I'm saying? Like that, that's why I really hesitate to go too deep and say like, this is the reason that God allows suffering. Um, so one other one that you mentioned is what's called the free will defense. It's like, well, it's good that God allow free will, but if you're going to allow free will, then you're, you're going to naturally end up with evil. And so God figured, well, the good of free will me is, is worth the, the bad over here that's, that it's going to produce. Um, I, would, I would exercise caution on, on routes like that. Like there is probably some truth there, but it can't be, that can't be the be all end all answer because are we going to have free will in heaven? Yeah. Uh, or is heaven going to have evil? Nope. So you can't automatically like put these two things together. Do you see what I'm saying? So uh, anyway, I'm exercising caution because there's a, I don't know, there, there's just, there are a lot of Christians who want to say, oh, the reason that God allows evil and suffering is blah. And it's like only a partial answer or it only covers some situations. And, um, and, and, and then skeptics get really irritated and think we haven't really th totally thought it through. Um, but anyway, the short answer has got to be that God, God is somehow more glorified in doing it this way. Um, and, and th th I think there has to be something to the idea that, well, let, let me think of, of how I can phrase it. I talked to a friend of mine a, a few days ago about this topic, and he said, he said many people view like the, the goodness or evilness of a, an event or a life uh, in terms of like, well, let's count up all the good things, good, 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 and then all the bad things, bad, 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 bad. And you sum it up, and it's like, oh, here's a number, right? And... Surely God is trying to minimize, against some kind of constraint, minimize the number of bad. And so he's doing the best he can. Um, I, don't, I don't see that we have to, to adopt that way of looking at it. Um, in fact, my friend and I, what we kind of ended up on is, is the idea that God seems to operate much more in the form of narrative. The idea that there can be evil, and that evil is swallowed up in good, glorifies him more than if the evil had never happened. 
Um, there is this language in the Bible that like when Jesus looked at the cross and the evil of the cross, he said he embraced it for the joy set before him. So, so I think when we, we think, you know, why is God letting me suffer? Why is this worth it? Does this glorify him? Like we have to look to Jesus and say, how did Jesus look at the cross? How did Jesus look at suffering? Um, yes, he affirmed that it was bad, but he also affirmed that it was worth it and that there was a, a joy on the other side. Um, maybe one good verse that would partially apply to this question is um, Romans 8.18. And let me see if I can do it from memory. It would be, uh, for I consider that the the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the, the glories that are be to, to be revealed in us. Something along those lines. I don't know. I don't think that totally answers your question, but <laughs> I think it's because I hesitate to go too far down the theodicy road. Man, Cody, only one I of us is working just, tonight, bro. I am just so, yeah. <laughs> Romans, Romans, I would add Romans 9. Uh, I think Romans 9 used the language to highlight the riches of his mercy. If there's no bad news, no evil and suffering, then um, the good it looks much different. Thank you for at least trying to earn your patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to actually ask if you would go back to your second premise. I know you didn't really want to camp out on that. Yeah, one, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine. The fact that God is good, yeah. at least personally, is a, is a based in the Bible and the belief that that is the word of God and it tells me there that he is good. Mm -hmm. What do you do about people that don't accept that first, that don't have the Bible that say, look at the world now, what we have now, is God good without the foundation of a belief in scripture? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess the, what I mean is um, someone who is in that circumstance, they don't accept the Bible, they don't accept that God is good what they're effectively doing with the, the problem with this argument is trying to offer a critique of Christianity. They, they would say, if there is a God, then you tell me that he's good. Um, and someone, someone could, you could punt on, on premise two and say, well, I guess there's a God, but maybe he's not good. But very few people do that. So uh, effectively, what, if someone is offering this critique, they're trying to say that God doesn't exist. Um, is that, does that kind of answer your question? So it's, it's possible that they, they, wouldn't exi they don't believe in God, but they know that, that the Christian does, and so they say, oh, you Christian, you say that God is good. Um, here are these premises. I think you accept all of them, but yet if you accept all of them, then it follows that God doesn't exist. And so we as Christians have to say, well, one of these, one of these premises is, is, a, is a mess. One of, them, one of them's wrong, and it's not number two. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So it's, it's an it's a external critique from the unbeliever. Yeah. My man... Chris. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What? No. Whoever else is going to have to wait. <laughs> uh, I guess I got a statement and then a question. Yeah. Um, the statement has never really helped me okay. overcome suffering, and I'm sure it won't help anybody else either. So, um, I've always seen I've seen suffering as you mentioned a book that said only uh, ba when bad things happen to good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I've always approached that saying, well, there's no such thing as a good person. And so, <laughs> yeah, correct. And so if there's no such thing as a good person, that means that the question should be not why are bad things happening to me, it's why aren't more bad things happening to me since I, you know, I deserve punishment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I, I get, oh, yeah. You, you basically right. just said Luke 13. That's really good. Like, someone asked Jesus this question, like, why did this bad thing happen? And he basically said something very close to what you just said. He said, don't ask if they did something wrong. Ask, like, why, why does God preserve me? Why does not this kind of thing? Right. Because right? I think a tower had fallen, ironically, right. on 9-11. A tower in Siloam had fallen down and some people had, had died. And so when we recognize our own sinfulness, the idea that, you know, why, does, why is God merciful to me so frequently in ways I don't even recognize mm -hmm. um, is very biblical. I think that's what Jesus was trying to get across in, in, in Luke 13. It, it, towards the question, I, I've, I've had friends who have had suffering, and then they'll, atheist friends, and then they'll sort of pursue the Bible, look at the mm -hmm. Old Testament, and they'll have some questions about the premise, too, about God being good, mm -hmm. you know, God commanding so many different things, so many mm -hmm. different rules that we're not really familiar with, and so... Yeah. I've read certain books like uh, Is God a Moral Monster by Paul mm -hmm. Copan and stuff like that, and he 
does the theodicy type thing, I guess, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. um, I'm just curious, um, what do we say in those times is, of, of justifying is God, is God good based on the Old Testament type thing? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny that you bring that up. Um, I've, I was thinking about that recently because my, my kids have been watching this little DVD series whenever we go in the car, a uh, DVD series called What's in the Bible. And in this, little, this DVD series for little kids, they actually talk about Joshua and, and uh, the army like killing all the Canaanites. They get into it. And I was like, wow. Like they, and it, I mean, and the, the point was like they don't, want, they don't want someone to be 18 the first time they realize like, hey, there's some kind of rough stuff in the, in the Old Testament, you know, along those lines. So they wanted to go ahead and address that. And so, I mean, usually those are pretty culture-specific. Um, the idea that God, in the Old Testament certainly, there's plenty of examples where God would use one people group effectively as judgment for sin upon another people group. Um, that sort of thing certainly happens, um, particularly when you, when you think about idolatry and some of the other things that, that, the, 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 that these other groups had done. Someone pointed out to me the other day, they said, part of the point of uh, the story of Abraham and Isaac is that human sacrifice is outlawed because that's what a lot of these other cultures did. So once you realize, like, oh, Joshua and, and the army is coming in and wiping out this other culture, what's this other culture like? And it may be that God's actually judging that culture, and God has the right to do that. I think that, that butts up against our sensibilities, but it doesn't mean God doesn't have the right to do it. One other thing maybe to push back on is um, it's pretty natural for us to get into this weird Old Testament, New Testament dichotomy. Have you ever heard people do this? It's like, you do, I'm not saying you do this, but, like, people very frequently are like, Old Testament God angry and scary. New Testament, Jesus, nice and gentle. Like Jesus says some like, like powerful rough stuff along the same kind of lines. Jesus talks about hell more than, than just about anybody else. And, that's, and actually those discussions of, of hell are actually probably the most difficult to deal with, even beyond um, some of the difficult stuff in the Old Testament. And in those cases, that's where you have to really harp on this idea that God is good and part of what God's goodness entails is justice. Um, we don't like it, but I mean, that, that is what makes... God the way he is. And as you kind of said, the response to God's justice is not, why are you, why are you doing this? The, the, the response is like, why do you show mercy? And kind of an amazement at God's merciful character. So, yeah. Micah, we have one back here. I might also add Chris before I pass this mic um, to that question about the Old Testament and those things that happen, you know, when God you know, commands his people to go and wipe out other people. Uh, he uses his people to bring judgment on those people for their sin, but that also happens to the people of Israel time mm. and time again. And so it's the same exact argument with Isaac and um, with, with Abraham and Isaac. Uh, God sent his son Jesus uh, to die and to suffer in, in our place and for our sins. And so when people talk about those atrocities in the Old Testament, or as, as they perceive them to be, uh, you have the correct, I think, line of thinking biblically is that God is, is using his people as an instrument of, of judgment against those people. But when God's people fall into idolatry and sin, he uses other nations to bring discipline to them. So it's a two, if it's a problem, it's a two-way problem because God's people get killed just as often as God's people kill people. Hmm. And so I think we can point that out to say, listen, the, the rules are the same for everybody. So it's not like God's people get to kill people, but God just preserves them all the time. No, they get killed. And, and, you know, in the exile, I mean, everybody's wiped out. The northern kingdom, the ten tribes, they're gone forever. And the southern kingdom, the, the, the remaining two tribes, I mean, they are exiled to Babylon, and, and most of the people are killed. So it, it's not like that doesn't happen to God's people as well. Just before the question, I, so as you were talking, Alan, one thing that jumps into my mind is, um, probably the roughest Old Testament passage I think I've ever seen is there's, a, there's actually a passage in the Psalms where it's, I think it's kind of a cry, I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head, but there's a, it's kind of a cry against one of these exterior oppressing nations that's coming against is Israel. And there's this verse and it actually has the language of like, blessed is he who dashes your little ones against a rock. And it's like, oh, like how horrible is that? And of course the context is that like, this is what these nations have been doing. Um, the idea that judgment would be brought, brought against them as a nation or as a culture um, does make sense and come from kind of a, pl a place of righteous indignation. Um, but what I heard Tim Keller, I listened to Tim Keller talk about this, and he said, ultimately, the solution to all this is not like, well, I take revenge on you and kill all your family. I take the, the ultimate solution to all that is that God allows his little one to be dashed against the rock, that God allowed his son to be killed. 
I thought, like, I, I don't know. I think that whole idea of, like, like you said, Alan, of relating it back to Abraham and Isaac, that all this stuff in the Old Testament, it's, it's all part of a narrative that ultimately points toward Jesus, really helps a lot. It really helps people make sense of it. Because otherwise, the Old Testament seems too much of a series of di- disconnected stories. So if you have, like, an overarching... This points to Jesus. It helps. It really helps people realize, like, why would God allow that to happen? Why is this in the Old Testament? Why am I hearing about it now? It's because it has to point to Jesus. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Hello. Um, so you did a good job of answering most of the aspects of this in the past two questions. But what I was going to point out, I don't know if you'll be able to give a, any more information on this, was when she asked her question about people not believing in the second premise where you mm-hmm. said that God is good, um, I just wanted to point out like what we learned about two weeks ago in Pastor Allen's um, sermon where they talk about how Genesis's context in which it was written is that it is a rebuttal to every other worldview where monotheism and a good God um, is different from, say, the Greek gods who um, fail and like oh yeah and do that sort of thing. So I was just thinking about how people believed it then um, and there had to be skeptics. Um, so... I don't know where the question is. No, I'm, 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 I'm with you. But, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I think we're almost running out of time. Yes, ma'am. One more right here. I got oh, okay. it. Yep, yeah, I got it. There. <laughs> All right. This we'll is go fast. I'm going to sure, answer your yeah, question. I have 10 quick seconds. Question. Go. All right. Yeah, we're uh, okay on time, Micah. We've got okay. seven right. or eight minutes. I have a pastoral question. So I think it's natural for someone going through suffering or having a friend go through suffering to try to look for a reason. Um, you know, I think we know that God's sovereign. There's going to be some good come out of this. So we, we look for a reason. Um, sometimes we see one and it gives us, um, you know, hope, but sometimes like the birth defects, we don't see a reason. What, what would you say to people who are looking for reasons every time suffering happens? Have any thoughts? I, I would, Job never got a reason, right? What's crazy about the story about Job, there really was a reason, and Job doesn't get to find out. <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, so I, I, I would hesitate to ever speculate, oh, this was the reason or that was the reason. Um, and the truth is, like, way too often when people do start speculating about what's the reason, what they end up landing on are those mistakes I talked about earlier. They think, oh, this is happening because God is punishing me for blah, 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 blah. Um, but... I think the cases where you can maybe be a little more confident God allowed this for this reason is when you see it giving him glory. Um, I think I have heard of certainly circumstances where someone had um, a child with birth defects or some other kind of difficulty, but in the end, that child brought great glory to God because of their circumstance. Those are maybe the circumstances where I would be like, yeah, that kind of seems like God allowed that to happen and then brought greater glory to himself out of it. But, I mean, we never know. If God doesn't tell us through revelation, then we don't know. And I think we have to, as a general rule, have to say, like, I am okay with not knowing. Because Job was okay with not knowing. And, um, and ultimately, God gave us this sign through Jesus that he cares instead of these specifics, like, oh, little reason in, in your circumstance. So I, I always err on the side of don't speculate, don't put words in God's mouth. One back here, Micah. Yes, sir. A scripture that has been important to me in my life is in Hebrews 5, 8, that Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Hmm. And then also the scripture that says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Amen. That one about him being the author and the finisher of our faith, I think that's, this is probably a good place to, to end the evening. Um, I've run into a few people who are nervous about how they are going to end their life or how, like, you know, they're like, well, I'm a Christian now and everything's going okay now, but what if some horrible incident happens? What if some accident happens? What if I lose a loved one? Or what if I face great suffering toward the end of my life? How do I know that I'm going to persevere in the faith? How do I know I won't fall away? And the answer is, is that, is that, that it's, not, it's not just up to you. God is the author and the finisher of our faith, which means he sovereignly and graciously preserves us all the way through and that you don't have to be scared of those kind of things. You don't have to be scared that God doesn't care about you, or that he's not going to stick with you. Um, that's actually the promise that he gives us is that he'll always be with us. Um, and so that, that's something that if, if you get nervous about the future, that, that should be a great comfort to know that, that uh, whatever... 
is thrown at you, it's not going to mean that that you're going to be separated from God. Okay, I think I'll end us there. Well, Micah, thank you for spending the evening with us and uh, giving us that talk and answering those questions as well. Uh, probably some of you still have questions that you'd like to ask Micah. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, our elders to come forward, and uh, we'll be here um, to try to answer questions, as well as if you just like prayer uh, for some suffering that you're going through in your life, we'd love to pray for you tonight. So uh, if the guys will come forward. Um, also, uh, in just a minute, we'll be dismissed. Um, if you got kids in preschool or children's ministry, uh, make sure you go back there and check them out, and then you're welcome to spend as much time as you'd like. Uh, some of you are here that are visitors. Uh, if you want information about membership classes or life groups, anything like that, come see us as well, and we'll do our best to get you connected. Thank you guys for being here tonight. You're dismissed.